a uh, very first lecture on, on single cell transcriptomics. So in this lecture, I will just give you a brief overview of what single cell transcriptomics is all about. We will focus on single cell transcriptomics only. So of course, there are also other applications you can have at the single cell level, for example, single cell ATEX. We have to make some choices during this course. Uh, so we will not be treating single cell ATEX, but a lot of um, concepts that we teach during this course can also be applied to other methods you can do at the single cell level. Um, I am sure uh, many of you have seen the comparison between bulk RNA-seq and a smoothie and single cell RNA-seq as the individual foods. I'm a bit lazy. I will use that comparison over here as well because I think it's a pretty good one, of course. So what you can uh, compare single cell uh, RNA seq to bulk RNA seq with again is a smoothie and individual fruit. So the bulk RNA seq would be a smoothie. So what you do is, of course, you take a certain tissue, you grind it, extract RNA. So everything from the tissue is together in that big smoothie of RNA. So you have no idea where that RNA actually came from, what the individual cell types actually were. And what most of you probably know very well, probably better than me, is that. The, um, the cell diversity inside the tissue can be huge and all of these cells can have different functions and um, some genes are much more relevant to be expressed in some cell types than in others. So what we see during bulk RNA-seq, if we see a difference in expression, of course, that's real, that's completely going on in the tissue, but we do not really have a good idea where that is coming from. With single cell transcriptomics, what we can do is uh, know where uh, what kind of genes were expressed in, in the individual cells, so let's say the individual fruit, and we can actually investigate uh, on the, the on the level of the cell type, so on the level of the fruit, let's say, instead of having everything together in this one big big smoothie. That means that you can uh, ask um, uh, answer biological questions uh, usually in a much more uh, specific way. So why then single cell RNA seq? Well, I hope I already explained a little bit um, with the comparison between the fruit and the smoothie. Um, but cells are, of course, essential for biology. So they are the basic structural, often, and functional unit of life. And they can be very diverse, they have very diverse functions. Um, and because of that, of course, for many applications, it's very interesting to actually do research at the cell level and not on the tissue level as we are used to with bulk RNA-seq. Um, what you can do with single cell RNA-seq is first of all, uh, annotate cells, meaning, okay, I have a certain expression profile and I know it came from one particular cell and based on the expression, not, uh, expression pattern, I can already tell what kind of cell type it probably was just by looking at the expression pattern. And that's already, very valuable, I would say, because then you have an idea of what kind of cell you've had in your tissue. In addition to that, of course, you can also compare certain treatments within the cell type. So you know what kind of cells you've had in a certain tissue, and they do a certain treatment. For example, you give it a certain drug or whatever, or you compare certain uh, tissues, and then you can also even say something about the state of the cell or the differential gene expression between and within cell types. So those are two very important things you can do with single cell transcriptomics. They are very abstract, what I'm saying now, but they find their applications in very, in very different ways, depending on, of course, the research question you have. So how would you usually generate uh, single cell rna seq data? And this is also, again, a very broad overview of typically done. So let's say you have a tissue. Uh, let's say you have fixed tissue, uh, meaning not, for example, blood, liquid tissue, but you have uh, whatever, let's say a tumor, for example. First, you have to dissociate uh, the tissue into individual cells, obviously. And then we need to isolate the single cell in order to actually sequence all the transcripts that are in that single cell. And that can be done in many different ways. We will talk about the most frequently used methods to actually 
do this single cell isolation after that sequencing. Um, then there is some capture of, of RNA. Of course, you have, you have a lot of different molecules in, in a single cell. And of course, we are now interested because we're looking at transcriptomics. We're interested in the, in the RNA. So we have to get it out somehow. Very often that is done by making use of polyadenylation. So this, this poly pill messenger RNA typically has. And then uh, do a reverse transcription so we can actually make it into DNA, so cDNA, and then sequence it. After the reverse transcription, there is the library preparation in order to be able to sequence the cDNA. So we're going to add some adapters there. And then the actual sequencing takes place. And by doing the sequencing, you generate FOSQ files usually. And we use these FOSQ files in order uh, in, with our uh, further downstream analysis. So then we have a quality control, at least at the read level, and then we go on with downstream analysis. And a lot of, most of the part of this course, especially the exercises, will be focused on this downstream analysis. We will be saying uh, quite a bit on this first part, so up from the dissociation to the sequencing in lectures uh, today, but day two and three, uh, at least, and also the afternoon of day one, we will be focusing on the quality control and the downstream analysis. So there are many technologies to create a uh, single cell transatomics data. Um, so it started uh, relatively recently, I would say, so in 2009, where people actually were able to uh, sequence the RNA of individual, individual cells. So then the library preparation really took place at the individual cell level when you have a single cell in a single well and during time both the throughput uh, or mainly the throughput the number of cells you could sequence in a single study uh, strongly increased and a lot of different uh, research groups and companies try to create methods enable uh, that would enable you to actually do that um, there are four main methods that are used nowadays to generate uh, single cell transatomics data. Um, I think the most basic one and also a very frequently used one is just where you separate your individual cell with a fax machine and then you have your individual cells in an individual well and then you do a library preparation on those individual cells in a well. Typically um, uh, the method that is used uh, to do that is called SmartSeq. Then we have droplet-based methods, um, and a very famous example uh, for that is the 10x uh, platform, when you have your cells in individual droplets, um, and that's how you separate the cells from each other. Then we have combinatorial indexing, and that's where you basically uh, add barcodes to your cell shuffle them, add new barcodes, and with that, you have some kind of combinatorial index and you can figure out which, um, which read origin came from which cell. More about that later in, in other slides. And there's also micro well based where you have a micro well plate, so a plate with very tiny, tiny wells that can fit basically a, a beat and a cell together. And by that, you individualize the individual cell or you separate the individual cells from each other. Um, so I will introduce those four frequently used technologies in the coming uh, four slides. Um, well, first of all, there's SmartSeq. Uh, with SmartSeq, uh, you use uh, FAC to get a single cell in a single well. So you do the library preparation per cell in an individual well. And that has quite a bit of advantages because, for example, you can sequence the entire gene. Uh, it's very typical for single cell transcriptomics that you only sequence a small part of the gene in order to estimate expression. But for smart you can sequence the entire gene as you might be used to with dog RNA seq where you also typically sequence the entire gene. Then there's 10x genomics. Um, more about that in the com 
split separate presentation uh, later on. So that will be after this uh, presentation. So what you do with uh, 10x genomics, you isolate your single cell in a GEM, a gel beat in beat in emulsion. So you have your cells inside an oil and that uh, in those oil you have um, uh, an emulsion with your cell in there and the cell is combined with an individual gel bead and because the gel bead has uh, specific properties you know which read origin you came from which cell. It's a bit of broad um, explanation of what it actually does more about it in uh, the presentation, presentation after this. So with the next other than uh, SmartSeq, what you do is you sequence your gene only from the tree prime end. So only the tree prime end of your gene or, or of your transcript get uh, sequenced, meaning that you do not have any idea of other parts of the gene. So you cannot do, for example, differential isoform expression. So you only measure gene expression with this typically uh, frequently used 10x platform. So just to explain a little bit more about this gel bead. So we have in a solution, we have gel beads with oligos attached to it. And those oligos uh, contain an adapter. So those which is needed for the sequencing. Then there is the barcode that is unique for the bead. So let's say this bead has the light green barcode. Well, this bit has the pink barcode, this one, the red one, and so on. So each bit has an individual barcode. And then there's a UMI, more about it later on. And then there's a poly BT tail. And that is, of course, you to actually capture the messenger RNA that is poly adenylated, so that's poly A. So what you will have is um, you move these beads and cells through um, certain, uh, some kind of a cell sorter. And because you have less cells than beads, just by chance, you have a big chance that a single bead uh, occurs with a single cell at some point in this oil. And because of that, you have a single cell associated with a single bead. And because you have a unique barcode for each bead, you know that everything you capture on that bead comes from a single cell, from an individual cell. And because you have these barcodes, you are going to sequence them later on, you know, which reads all came from the same cell. Um, so if you then look at what you are actually sequencing um, in, uh, if you're using the 10X pre-prime platform compared to, for example, SmartSeq, well, with SmartSeq, obviously you often, you sequence the entire gene. So if you have the gene body over here, so let's say if you take all genes together and you, um, look what part of the of all the genes are sequenced. So for 10X, for the three prime method, you mainly sequence the three prime end of a gene. Well, for uh, SmartSeq, you sequence the entire gene. So you have much better coverage over the entire gene. If that is important to you, then uh, it is relevant to take it into consideration, of course. Um, <clears throat> usually with uh, the 10X platform, you have a much higher throughput in terms of number of cells. So you, have, you can sequence way more cells uh, compared to SmartSeq because with SmartSeq, you sequence the individual cells in an individual well. And at some point, these places become too big. So you can go only up to what you can handle in, let's say, a 384 well plate, for example. So typically, people do not use more than more than four plates for 384 well plates in a single experiment. Um, so therefore, um, you uh, sequence often way more cells with a 10x platform, but with smart SmartSeq, you do not only sequence the entire gene, but you also usually detect more genes per cell, just because uh, you can more specifically generate libraries for a single cell. So you can optimize it more, and therefore you have a higher library complexity per cell, so you can sequence more uh, type more genes, and therefore you have a much better representation of the whole transcriptome of your single cell. So if we would compare the two, 
So SmartSeq and 10x uh, genomics. So both of them are based on a sequencing messenger RNA, so fully adenylated RNA. With 10x genomics, there's a strong bias towards the tree prime end. Smart SmartSeq, you can sequence the entire gene. For 10x genomics, you only can use it for uh, expression analysis. Maybe differential polyadenylation, if you would be interested in that, but that's a very specific uh, research topic, I would say. For SmartSeq, you can both measure expression, but also isoform analysis, if you would be interested in that. So you have a low number of transcripts per cell you can measure with 10 genomics. At some point, you can just cannot, uh, the beat that we use for 10 genomics can, just cannot capture more RNA than is already in there. For SmartSeq, you can have a much higher library complexity per cell, and therefore you capture, you actually sequence more transcripts per cell. Um, for 10 genomics, you use the cell sorter, uh, which is quite an investment. For SmartSeq, you only need a fax machine, which is in many labs already available. For droplet uh, based or 10x based, you go, go up to 100k cells per run. Uh, for SmartSeq, you usually do not go up to uh, more than a thousand uh, cells per run. Um, a bit of a downside of 10x genomics can be that you have to run all the cells at once through this, this cell sorter, which means that a single sample is a single library is a single run. Can be, there are ways to, 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 to deal with that, but by default, you only have one sample as one library, which means that the sample is always compounded with the library. For SmartSeq, you can use more complex or uh, experimental designs. So that means that one cell is one library and you can, uh, for example, have block design with that. So isolated by droplet. So you can have quite a bit of doublets in there, meaning that uh, a single um, beat is associated with not one cell, but by, just by chance with two cells. And by having that, um, you of course do not estimate the expression profile of one cell, but of two cells at the same time. Uh, it can be a bit of an issue. Uh, also, for example, if you load too many cells on there, you have a lot of doublets. Uh, for facts, it can, you can have some bias uh, towards cell size. For example, uh, it's easier apparently to have bigger cells in wells with, with facts than smaller cells. So you might actually have a lower representation of smaller cells in there. First cell, of course, standard economics is way cheaper because the throughput is much higher compared to, to smart seed. So it very much depends on your application, whether you want to use uh, 10 economics or, or smart Um I have a question about that. And I'll ask it now. I think that's most convenient. So let's say we are, well, we have been comparing smart with 10x. Um, <clears throat> my question is, uh, by having this kind of information, which method would you use if you are mainly interested in rare cell types? So cell types that do not occur very frequently in tissue. And which one would you choose if you would be interested in mainly lowly expressed genes? The so genes that are not very highly expressed in your cell. This is them. Great. So most of you have answered correctly, I would say. Uh, so drop the base for rare cell types and smart seq for lowly expressed genes. With droplet based, you sequence a lot of cells. You can sequence a lot of cells in a single run, meaning that uh, you're also um, cells that are relatively rare, so that do not occur very frequently, are probably also in your sample or in the number of cells you are sequencing. So you have some representation there. Um, that uh, you might miss those for SmartSeq because you are just limited to a certain number of cells. So usually up to a thousand, let's say. But with SmartSeq, you have much more complex, much complexer libraries because you can just sequence more transcripts within a cell. And therefore you sequence also these lowly expressed genes. There's a question of three. Yeah, I could like to ask that uh, if the cells are too rare and then if you use the, um... 
how to say, if you use droplet base, and then you have another population that is so dominant, it's going to be, at the end, it's going to be kind of overridden by this big population. Now, is it the better way maybe to sort out this rare population? Yeah, yeah. Smart sick? Of course. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so um, if you can, of course, uh, enrich uh, your sample for these rare cell types, uh, that's always a good idea to do that. And they could even use uh, smart to actually sequence those if you have it enriched enough. Uh, but there, you can, of course, also imagine that there are uh, situations where you are not really sure uh, what kind of cells they are, and therefore you can really sort them out. Or maybe you are just very... Uh, ex, uh, you're you're at a very exploratory exploratory phase, uh, so you are just uh, looking for a method to to sequence a, much, uh, a diversity of cells instead of a diversity of transcripts within the cell, and that's where you would use Tenex. If you are interested in these in these well these big libraries per cell, then go for Smart. Thanks, good question. Yeah, indeed. So cell sorting is always an option, of course, definitely. Okay, so what we have done now is compared uh, the droplet-based methods and then mainly the 10x platform with a um, platform that is based on individual cells and individual wells, which is often SmartSeq, uh, smart the SmartSeq method. There are two relatively new methods uh, that have quite high potential. They're not super new, but they are emerging, let's say they are used uh, more and more frequent. So that's why I want to also discuss them over here. One of them is um, combinatorial indexing. And there is a company that actually commercialized it, which means that you can actually buy kits, which is usually very nice. It's therefore much, usually much easier to apply, much easier to use. So it is a completely different way of being able to individualize the, the single cells. So what you do is you have a cell, uh, your cells in an emulsion, let's say, and you fix it with formaldehyde. And after that, you do a ligation with barcodes to, uh, to your RNA, but this RNA remains inside those cells. After that, you split your cells into multiple pools and you add a new barcode. Then you combine those again and you split them again, add a new barcode. And then just by chance, if you do that four times, just by chance, you have a unique set of barcodes and you need the set of combination of barcodes per cell. Meaning that just by sequencing this unique set of barcodes, you know by a certain, uh, by a certain chance that all of those reads you have, you have in sequencing originate from a single cell. Um, so by doing four rounds, it is very unlikely that you end up uh, with, uh, depending on the number of cells you put in, of course, that you end up with cells, uh, two different cells having the same combination of indexes. And um, therefore you have individual uh, reads per cell or reads per individual cell. You can trace them back to the individual cell. So the nice thing about this is that it's quite uh, flexible. So you're working with fixed cells and uh, there are no uh, specific devices needed. So you just buy a kit, which is not super uh, expensive. And you do this combinatorial indexing just by yourself. You can do it by yourself in, in the lab and then do the sequencing. A bit of a disadvantage, disadvantage of this is that it's quite laborious. So of course, by doing the splitting and the pooling again, that uh, has, requires quite a few manual steps. But still, it's a good alternative uh, to, uh, to droplet-based sequencing like the Tenex platform, for example, because you do not need uh, one of those cell sorters. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of throughput and everything, you are at a similar level. So you can also go up to more than 10,000 cells uh, per, per experiment. Let's say. Or pool. Then another alternative um, is uh, based on micro wells commercialized by uh, BD. It's called BD Rhapsody. Uh, so, what you do there, in a way, is kind of similar to SmartSeq, but what you do is you do not use 
fuck who actually have an individual, an individual cell in an individual well. But what you do is you have a micro well, you have beads in there, and you sparsely load cells on this micro well. And because it's sparse, meaning that you have very few cells in there, just by chance, it's very likely that you only have a single cell in a single micro well. So many of the micro wells do not uh, receive a cell, and a few of those they do. And because of that, you, it's very likely that you have a single cell in a single well. Within that well, you uh, lyse your cell, hybridize your messenger RNA to a bead again, in a way similar to this droplet-based. And uh, your messenger RNA hybridizes to that bead, and then you continue with the sequencing. Um, like uh, 10x genomics, and also like PD Rhapsody, by the way, you only sequence the three prime end of, of a gene. Um, one advantage of this is, uh, is that you can actually see your doublets in there. So if you have two cells associated with a single bead, you actually know uh, that that is happening. So you can estimate your, um, uh, the, the percentage of uh, doublets you would expect in your data set. You cannot trace it back to the individual barcode, by the way. So you only know that there are doublets in there, but you do not know which uh, barcode are associated with doublet or which beats associated with doublet. Okay, so this was the question I just asked. So then a few words about experimental design. Uh, in a way, experimental design is not different from any other biological experiment. So that means also for single cell transcriptomics, you require replication, you require randomization and you require blocking if, uh, if needed. Um, <clears throat> which means that, well, if you are comparing a drug, for example, so treated with untreated, for example, you need replicate of treated with untreated. And um, if you have, for example, cages with mice, make sure you include those cages in a block design. Um, also with experimental design, like any other biological experiments, be aware of confounding factors. So confounding factors are factors that confound with your treatment. So that are not your treatment, but um, um, are associated with the same sample that received the treatment or did, did not receive the treatment. Which means that, for example, make sure that if you have multiple people handling the, the different uh, samples, make sure, for example, that not one person is doing all the treated bonds and the other person is doing all the untreated bonds. That's what, that's what confounding is. Also, this can, this can happen with reagents or, for example, the time of processing. Do you process one of them at one day, one treatment at one day, and one treatment at the other day, for example? That's also confounding. Uh, and it can even be the sequence itself or the lane of the, or the library. So lane of the, or maybe the lane uh, can also uh, have an effect on uh, expressing new measures. So if you have, for example, all of your uh, treated samples on one lane, all of your untreated samples on another lane, you could just be measuring lane effects. Um, if there are any of those factors and it's, uh, they, they pop up during processing, for example, um, realize that they are there, uh, try to um, have it randomized as much as possible, have it blocked as possible, uh, as much as possible. And if there are any factors that could affect gene expression, make sure to record it, because if it is nicely blocked, then you can actually correct for it later on. Um, there are quite a few papers on experimental design in single cell uh, transcriptomics. Uh, there are a few links to those at, uh, at this slide. So just uh, another um, uh, example of a confounded design, let's say you are doing SmartSeq. And what you can, of course, do, what would be the most easy would be to have, uh, let's say we have the, the, the light gray ones are untreated and the brownish ones, brownish mice, they are treated. In principle, what you could do is having all the cells of the individual mice on a separate plate, process, process these plates, for example, you, uh, processing takes quite a bit of time, so maybe you can do two plates in a day, um, process these plates individu individually, and then have them also 
individually on sequencing lanes. Of course, what you get then is that you get an ordering effect of the plate. And if you cannot process all the plates on a single day, then you already have an effect of the, of the day. And then you also get an effect on of the sequencer lanes. And they're all compounded within the plate. And you can imagine that these effects can become pretty big at some point. They just build up. Um, better design there would be a more balanced design where you actually divide your different mice over the plates. Maybe it would even sometimes be better to have completely randomized, but uh, within those places can be quite of a challenge. But then let's say you have all your, uh, in all your plates, you have your different mites represented. So your plate within the blocks, and then you have um, these different plates divided over different sequencing lanes. So you now can help have it blocked. And you know which uh, plate, well, of course, which mites is in which uh, individual well. So you later on, you can even correct for example, the plate, if you're doing differential gene expression, for example. A question for you. There we go. Of course, related to experimental design. So let's say you want to compare two groups of mice, treated and untreated to the drug, and that this preparation is labor intensive, as is very often the case, obviously. So you ask a good colleague, and what will be your plan there? So there are three possibilities here. Okay. Most of you have answered, so I'll stop. There we go. Nice. Very good. So the message came across, obviously. Uh, that's very nice. So of course, um, well, the third one is, is just not, not correct. Uh, I process all of the treated and she processes all of the untreated, so we don't get mix ups. Well, that's where you start having compounding effects because your colleague might do the this preparation slightly different from you than you or completely different from you. And then you're just not measuring the treatment of the drug. No, you can be measuring the actual different ways of how to prepare the tissue. And usually you're not interested in that. You're interested in the effect of the drug. And you cannot separate them anymore because they are confounded. Uh, asking a colleague is a bad idea. I will take multiple days process, which means that you will get a day effect. Of course, at some points you just have, sometimes you just have to have multiple days or very often you just have to have multiple days. Then you try to uh, process, of course, not um, all treated samples in week one and all untreated samples in week two. Now you try to, um, you try to randomize that, but of course, um, if we can process everything in a single day um, uh, and, and, and not too long time span, we randomly assign the mice from both treatments of each of it, so we can, and we write it down, so we can even correct for it later on. So then a few um, related methods uh, to single cell transcriptomic, uh, what you can do in addition to uh, measuring um, gene expression um, is to quantify proteins. So what you do there, and that's a method that is uh, very frequently used in combination with the 10X platform or with um, uh, SciSeq, for example, is where you have an antibody, uh, can be any antibody, and attached to that antibody, you have your adaptive sequence that is required for sequencing an index that is specific for the antibody. And then let's say, for example, a poly A uh, tail. And um, if uh, you make sure that these antibodies, you can let them bind to, to your cell, you wash away the unbound antibodies, and then you proceed to the sequencing. And because it has this poly A tail, also these sequences, they are captured by the 10X platform. And because you have a specific barcode associated with an antibody, you know that that antibody actually attached uh, to your cell. Nowadays, um, this is this has become more evolved. This is not a poly A tail anymore, but a specific capture sequence. So you can actually know you have uh, they, those um, uh, antibody uh, associated uh, oligos. They, they do not compete with the messenger RNA uh, to a B. 
Um, so what you can do is therefore quantify um, uh, proteins together with messenger RNA, which can be super powerful, of course. And you can have quite a few. I think you can have up to three to 400, maybe even more, maybe even 500 uh, different antibodies and have a very uh, good idea of the entire uh, proteome of a cell in combination with the entire transcriptome. The same method, a very similar method, uh, you can use to actually combine multiple samples together in a single run for 10x, our droplet-based method. So what you do there is you have an antibody that uh, binds to any cell, and uh, you have, uh, again, an index uh, on your, uh, attached to your uh, antibody, and of course, an antibody a tail or a tail capture sequence. But that index is not specific for a certain antibody or a certain protein. No, it's specific for a certain sample. So you make sure these antibodies, they attach to your cells before pooling. So for the individual samples, you uh, hybridize them with these antibodies. Then you pull the cells together. And then you proceed with the regular uh, 10x protocol. So you make sure they are associated with individual uh, beats with individual indexes, and then you do the sequencing, but you also then are, therefore sequence for each cell anything, all the, uh, and the, the barcode sequences of the antibodies that are associated with that cell. Meaning that you figure out where that cell, cell origin came from, from which sample it came, so you demultiplex it, but also if you have multiple barcodes within a single cell, let's say, you also know that it was a, um, a duplex. So uh, a duplet, I should say, a duplet. So multiple cells within a single well. So that can be quite powerful and also can reduce costs quite a bit. I have another question for you. Okay, so of course, related to what I just said. So if you're using antibodies to quantify proteins, and I just gave the answer in the, in the presentation, which sequence do you use in your downstream analysis for quantification? So you want to quantify the protein, right? So the more antibody binds to your cell surface proteins, the more like the, the more proteins are likely work, right? Okay, I think I will give you the answer, or at least show what, what you have answered. Okay, very good. Okay, so most of you have really understood what we have been talking about. It's great. So it's indeed the barcode linked to the antibody tagging the protein of interest. So you have all these antibodies that uh, bind to your cell surface protein, and the more of these antibodies bind, the more of the barcode you will have in, uh, in your individual cell, let's say, an individual thing that was captured uh, by, the, by the oil uh, and is together with the same uh, gel bead. And therefore, you have more of the barcode and barcode specific for the antibody. And the more of those barcodes you have, the more of the protein was in there. Just to see the image, so the more of those guys bind, the more of that index you have in there, and the more you see. That. Okay, last slide. Um, so we have been talking about single cell sequencing a lot, and we will be mainly focusing on that, of course, but there's also something called single nucleus uh, sequencing. It's kind of an alternative to single cell RNA, so you get very similar data out of that. Uh, you also at some point get counts per cell, but then it's per nucleus actually. Um, can be very interesting, for example, for tissues that are difficult to dissociate, so where, that are difficult where to actually uh, get the individual cells out, but usually it's more easy to get the individual nuclei out of there. Um, uh, an advantage of that is that uh, because you extract the individual nuclei, you also get rid of all the ribosomes, which means there is no translation of uh, transcription factors anymore that can affect then the transcriptome again during processing. So you kind of stop this whole uh, 
uh, translation process, meaning that you might have a better representation of the actual messenger RNA that was in the nucleus in the tissue itself. Um, uh, a downside of that is, of course, you miss old messenger RNA uh, that is not in, in the nucleus. And I'm not really sure whether it's because of that, but at least what people have found is they found a lower representation of immune cells and surface protein. Um, and then you do a single nucleus RNA seed. So that's a bit of a downside, meaning that if you are mainly interested in those kind of uh, genes, then single nucleus RNA seed might not be a very good idea. Or maybe might not get information required. 